All right, so let's have some story time with Berkey. So going through a couple of these things, you always see customers and hear stories of people with varying challenges and varying things happening. And it doesn't matter if you're a SRE, if you're a developer, if you're an operations person or just as someone who manages an IT budget. The reality is sometimes requests into IT are massive. And in the case here, there was a customer I was working with who started to deploy off a platform for self-service and provisioning, uh, and they were in charge of managing that for the developers. The developers, the promised lands for them were very much around, you can request your own infrastructure, you can request your own resources, please use our platform to achieve this. Now, as an SRE, this person had a number of uh, service level objectives to achieve and guaranteeing uptime, availability, uh, consumption of resources. Now. We know, like when you move house, like when you uh, do things in life, if you move house, for example, you move into a bigger house, you might go, oh, I'll never need five bedrooms, two garages, a rumpus room. But after a year of living there, what, what do you notice? You've filled up every single room. Every bedroom is filled. Every garage is filled. You just grow into your space. This is very much like the tenants and people who use your infrastructure. If they know they have it, they will use it, right? And so this particular... Uh, SRE was struggling with maintaining a service level objective of uptime, availability. There were people getting annoyed at the fact that they couldn't request resources. People were doing a land grab for these resources. And as such, the service became unstable and a little bit rough around the edges. So uh, these are stories you hear quite often. I work in the field for HashiCorp and you find that customers out there are having problems such as this. This is not a new story. This is not something that you need to go and fabricate because you go and see to speak to people, the practitioners on this presentation will feel the urges and twinges of some of these things that I've said. And so today we're going to speak in the context of Nomad as a scheduler and a platform for developers to use and schedule runtime scans, how we can take some of these considerations and leverage them for multi-tenancy and to provide a stable platform in addition to providing a number of service level objectives to you know for a production environment. Now, um, as introduced by Mel, I'm Berkey. So I work in a field at HashiCorp on different accounts. Um, before that, I spent seven years at VMware as a field engineer on NSX um, by way of helping customers get out of a pretty nasty spot and get into a better place. So um, that's me. I have a bit of a penchant for scheduling and runtimes and everything to do with Vault. And yes, I'm a big fan of all the Rings, Star Wars and board games. So pretty geeky. Pardon about the background behind me. I currently am renovating and I'm in with my parents, which is uh, a joy as a 33 year old with three kids and a wife. It's uh, all a bit of fun. So if there's my old man rocks behind the scenes, uh, I do apologize. So let's go through the agenda. Today in this half an hour, I'm gonna be short and concise and get to the point regarding a number of things that are really good takeaways. And then we're gonna to put together at the end, hopefully with a demo and leave some time for questions. But we can always tailor that accordingly. We're going to cut off the Whalen Utani Corp, who is our guest, uh, you know, role play customer. Namespaces, resource quotas, access control lists and policies, the Vault integration, and then we're going to put it all together nicely. So, who is Whalen Utani Corp? Whalen Utani Corp are a company out of uh, Aliens, Prometheus, whatever show you want to watch there, uh, out of uh, Blade Runner as well, and they look at having requirements to schedule uh, workloads in multi-team deployments and also support their operations off-world. We're putting our role-playing hat on now, right? They have many uh, divisions that create their off-world colonies. They need IT infrastructure support back on Earth to ensure that they're uh, colonizing and terraforming the galaxy and, and the planets uh, goes, goes quite smoothly. They have a number of varying workload requirements between logistics, R&D, administration, finance, um, amalgamating different companies. They have a lot of demands of their infrastructure. And the requirements are the workloads need to be run and that do run are not impacted by a noisy neighbor, that are guaranteed to run in a secure fashion, and they can be efficiently scheduled inside these environments. So that is the guiding star to our conversation today and the use cases and discussions we have regarding some of these multi-tenant principles will come up about um, around these use cases here. So let's start off with the first one. Let's start off with what are Nomad namespaces? 
Now, namespaces are a concept recently lifted out of enterprise back into open source as a version one that allow the segregation and separation of objects. Now, what does that mean to a um, user? That means that I can create a logical partition of my Nomad cluster that allows me to schedule allocations and different uh, workloads inside it that has an, uh, its own bubble. It means that I can have representation of business units, of projects, and other logical uh, overlays that ensures that I can start putting boundaries up around different parts of my infrastructure. Now, why? Different business units, the notion of resource quotas, you have a noisy neighbor, a noisy neighbor being someone adjacent to me who's consuming resources of the same infrastructure, potentially stealing my resources. And there are sometimes there are regulations. In the case of Whale and Yutani Corp being a mega corp, generally they make the regulations. But in the, back in the real world, these could be things like SOX compliance, or they could be things like APRA if you're in Australia, the prudential regulators. So how do I use name, name, namespaces? Now, given we're going to wrap this up with a demo at the end, I won't labor on this too much. But simply, if we're going to use the CLI, we're going to do Nomad Namespace Apply to put a description around it, because I like to be thorough, and the name, then put a namespace name. So description is Wayland Utani Corp um, R&D production name, and the namespace is R&D-prod. Straightforward, Nomad takes this, starts to build out the, uh, the namespace accordingly. So what does that look like logically? For us, logically, that starts to mean that I'm going to start carving up the infrastructure. So if I click here and look at this here, I can do this again and again multiple times. And I go from having logistics dev to R&D dev, R&D prod, logistics prod, so on and so forth. And that starts letting me then, when I start allocating jobs to Nomad via my pipeline or via my whatever means appropriate, applying these jobs, they'll be assigned to a namespace. And that namespace will have controls, policies, and access lists around it. And we'll slowly build to that state towards the end. This means that we can start putting workloads that are relevant to a customer or a business unit into their box, so to speak. All right. So let's talk about resource quotas. Now, I will caveat this. This one here is there is an enterprise feature, so it does require a commercial relationship with HashiCorp. So just for transparency reasons, I'll tell you that one. And I'll call out what is, this is the only thing I believe that I talk about that is enterprise. Quotas do allow us to define a limitation of what will be consumed and or scheduled inside a namespace. Now, it works in concert with namespaces, it allows me to, as an operator, define a number of resources. Now, as a Wayland Utani Corp SRE, I know that logistics pay a lot more money than R&D for things. So I'm going to make sure that they, you know, for a bit of a chargeback model, you can internally charge a set of uh, arbitrary number for trade of resources. And you can enforce that as a hard, hard cap, which means I can start saying, okay, logistics, I know that the cluster has 10, 10 gig of memory and it has 10,000 megahertz of CPU. But what I want to do is I'm going to guarantee that you can use up to four, right? doesn't mean necessarily you can use it all because of the constraints of the over cluster and you can oversubscribe, but I'm going to guarantee, you know, we're going to say you can have 4,000 uh, megahertz and four gig of RAM, which means logistics can schedule workloads and allocations until I hit that upper limit, which means that you can have someone doesn't come in here and just deploy a job and then consume everything. I'm going to be fat finger burky and put in 10 gig of memory for my job, which I know I don't need. It avoids that oversizing conundrum. By testing a subset of resources, it can be done on different sizes for different teams. So team one can have an allocation of 1,000 megahertz and a gig. Team two can have you know, 4 gig and 4,000 megahertz. Whatever combination you want to do and apply, it's super handy here. What this helps in is it helps for a number of things. If you're using such something like uh, preemption with Nomad, which allows you to say this job is got a higher priority and that's allowed to kick things off the cluster or deschedule things, or uh, if there's not enough resources to schedule it instead of, it stops someone coming along and being somewhat malicious and going, I'm going to schedule a higher priority uh, allocation with more resources and then essentially starve the cluster out. So these are sort of some of the problem spaces that occur when being humans, people think for themselves, they want their application to run and not maybe being considerate of the uh, other users of the cluster. So by putting some of these guardrails in place, this helps our SRE of this platform start maintaining and having a chance of meeting these SLOs, you know, uptime, availability, resource control. 
So what does that look like for my cluster? And again, we'll demo this after. So this is a logical representation. I can do a nomadic quota init, and that spits out a template for me, which is super handy, because I can then look at spec HTL and have a gander at what's inside it. Now, what is inside that particular cluster, uh, that spec HTL? So I can see here I have a name, it's default quota. The description is limit the shared default namespace. Well, cool, I'm not going to apply the default namespace because that's where I do most of my management stuff. But I'm going to look at here, this limit stanza. And this limit stanza here shows the region, so the region of the, uh, you're applying it to. So in Nomad, the concept of regions are a grouping of Nomad nodes. And that region limit, so I'm going to say on um, on this namespace that I apply this to, in the region of prod, I'm going to limit that to 2,500 megahertz CPU and 1,000 in memory, right? You can provide a limit, so other allocations, but these are things to think about that you can do. Which means then, as a user here, I can apply, for example, to my logistics dev namespace, I can apply 4,500 megahertz of CPU and 8, uh, 8 gig of RAM. Alternatively, I can apply 2,500 and 4 gig of RAM to dev, right? So this allows you to start isolating out and controlling those particular namespaces with quotas and guaranteeing a level of resources or a slice of a pie. Now, we move into now a topic that is a little bit meatier and far more, it could be its own uh, hashi talks in its own right, and multiple hashi talks in its own right. Uh, Nomad access control lists and policies, and the child subject vault integration to drive these access lists. Now, Nomad ACLs are the engine that require, uh, that builds out token-based access to assets inside uh, Nomad. And it essentially can be applied at a namespace level, a job level, but essentially allows a scheduler to start saying, I need a token to perform an action. And that action is based on a list of policies. Now this, by default, you turn on Nomad, it just works, right? But think about this in production. What stops Mal logging into my cluster and just scheduling jobs willy nilly, or, or uh, we have other people come on board doing that for us, right? Is that if I click on my screen, I preempt myself, go back Berkey. We, we have people scheduling stuff, we, we lose control. And what we want to do is just put a better semblance of, I know who you are, you can have a token, you can do something. And that something might be read a cluster, or might be read plus schedule jobs, based on the roles and personas of our SRE team, right? So for example, I want Mel to be able to schedule some jobs, but I don't want her necessarily reading node information, or I don't want her retrieving or fiddling with the storage array behind the backs nomad, right, through the CSI integration. And I can provide that granularity through policies and tokens. So token, who I am, policy, what I can do, which is super stuff because that allows us to have an ability to accommodate the craziness of enterprise. So the, the reality is RBAC is what can you give me and what can I tweak? And also then you have people who are snowflakes that have really odd permission structures based on geopolitical reasons or uh, audit, auditing and requirements that say you someone can read but can't write, someone can audit but not read or write in various funny scenarios as that. Which, which means I can apply at a namespace level these particular policies. And here's the policy, it's very interesting. It's actually reflective of how pretty cool Nomad is, is that I have a policy named read. And we have these high level verbs, read, write, deny, delete, for example. And I'll show them on the next slide. And I have capabilities. Now you can have a block of a verb here being read and it includes a number of capabilities. You can additionally cherry pick varying capabilities from higher and more permissive roles, which is a super way of saying, this person can read Nomad jobs and read Nomad information, but I'm going to actually let them dispatch a job and submit jobs to the scheduler as well, which elevates them in certain areas. So you can see here, if I look at the read side, I can see read, and I've also got from the write policy, I have submit job, dispatch job, which lets me pick these capabilities out. So you can probably start thinking in the back of your head, there's a number of ways here to build out some unique policies for my environment, which is super. Again, we apply this at the namespace level and we issue a token from that namespace, we get the policy inherited to it. And I'll show off how we do that there. Now, that's all well and good, but that requires a management token, issuing a token to someone else to then be able to use it. I have to issue that token to Mel to for Mel to use a cluster. Now, that requires me to be up and awake and I want to sleep at night time. I've, I've had this really, I've this cluster down, pants around my ankles for the last however long. I want stability, I want self-service, I want self-provisioning. Now, Nomad integrates with HashiCorp Vault and HashiCorp Vault 
has two integration points here. One for the scheduler to generate tokens and access to the scheduler itself to access Vault. And the other is rendering job templates. So inside my job, I can retrieve key value store uh, values, transit encryption keys, PKI keys for my workload themselves, right? So there's the scheduler side, which we've been speaking about, and there's the job side. So let's talk through the, uh, the integration side of the Nomad node. I will configure Nomad in the server configuration. I'll add the Vault URL. I'll add the Vault URL. Um, initial and the initial root token. Initial, sorry, root token. The initial token for Vault, and I will point it towards uh, from Nomad to Vault. Happy days. On every client, I'll point it with a Vault stanza towards Vault with the name of Vault, and that's all I, what I do. Rotate the service. Vault's up. And, Vault is up and running. Uh, Nomad's up and running. On the Vault side, I'm building the configuration out to build the Nomad engine, assign the roles, and generate the, the token for Vault to, cons uh, to be consumed via Nomad. Now, this is in our learn documentation, which I'll link to at the end, but uh, these steps are pre-done for the demo. It's a very, very lightweight integration for them to subsequently build out this functionality. So let's talk through that workflow. This demo that I'm about to do shortly will show this off, but this picture is how my mind thinks. So I like to go through it with you as well. So the request that will go to Vault. So Mel, instead of coming to Berkey for a token now for Nomad, going to Vault. Logs into Vault. Now we use Active Directory at Wayland Lutani, which is a, a now a galactic uh, identity broker. But what happens here, Mel logs into Vault using an Active Directory login based on her role inside Vault and what her Active Directory login is assigned to, she gains access to the Nomad role. And that means they can do a read against the Nomad engine to retrieve a relatively, a relatively scoped Nomad token, which that token comes back to Mel. And at the same time, Vault has spoken to Nomad and said, build me an ACL please. And that goes back to Mel, right? The ACL token. Now, Mel wants to submit a job. Fantastic. So what's going to happen here is that this value that's come back, this secret ID, needs to be added into either if Mel's going to use the uh, CLI for Nomad to submit the job, or if it's going to be a CI-CD tool, this token needs to be imparted as an environment variable or some sort of hidden variable into that tool. So when it issues and interacts with Nomad, so your Nomad job uh, run, it goes, where's the token? The token's part of the environment variable. It's passed along. Nomad knows what this token is because Vault's told it, this is your new token, right? So this Heidi here, now I'm self-servicing my particular credentials. So when that job is submitted, Nomad accepts it, Nomad schedules a job and the job's up and running, which is fantastic. Now, the other side of the coin is where Vault plays its hand in securing workloads themselves. Now, this is all part of the self-service story because we don't want to be involved in this as Nomad. We want to stay out of it. We want the developers just to work. So we have a database server already running. This would be the demo that I'm about to do. I have, as a requester, I've requested, um, you know, I've activated an authenticated to Vault and I'm already uh, scheduled the job. My job though has a template inside it. Using console template or Nomad template, I have here, I want to write a file called secrets slash json.config. And I want to render dynamically the access a vault mount called database access database creds, which will generate dynamic credentials from vault. And I want to impart the value returned from uh, the integration to username and password, pipe it to JSON and write it to a file, which means I have a dynamic connection string for my database. So what happens here is the job gets scheduled. Nomad renders that configuration, sees that there's actually some vault request here. Vault, uh, Nomad will talk to vault. Vault will return the value to Nomad. Nomad renders the job template as it's being parsed by the, the server leaders and then render that and schedule that job accordingly. It stands up now with a connection. And what we're going to see here is the web being able to talk to the database. And that's all happening now without me being around, which is super. In the meantime, whilst I've requested that data in the web tier, because I've hit a dynamic database engine and that's been paired with this particular database, it's going to actually put that credentials that it's here for my job into the Myers SQL database, dynamically programming it, giving us access. Now, this is how Nomad and Vault work in concert together, both at a scheduler level, controlling Mel's ability to schedule and my ability to schedule. And then also from a job perspective of where I can actually render that out uh, from a template. So 
you can see if I switch between two slides, here I've got values I want to be rendered and interpolated. Here's the post interpolation of that file, right? If I hop into that container and look at that rendered output, that's the dy dynamic credential. It's only valid for 30 minutes for a period of time while that web server does its thing, and then it gets rotated out. So super stuff there. Now, I'm sure there's questions in the chat, which I'll get to shortly. I've still got 10 minutes up my sleeve. and I'll go through a five minute demo. So we'll go through the demo of what we're talking about here today. We'll go through this stuff here. It is putting together what we discussed in this presentation thus far. Now, me being me, I have a demo run book on the side here just in case I stuff this up, but it should be pretty good uh, to remember most of this. I have also my cheat sheet and run sheets with me. Now, because you know, always get sweaty, clammy hands when talking about stuff, no matter how well you know it, I think you always get sweaty. That and it's 35 degrees here today, so it's a bit warm. So let's go through. So I have my Nomad cluster, no namespace is configured. This is all live, it's all real. I'll refresh it for you. There's no smoke and mirrors when it comes to Berkey doing stuff, right? So if I look at namespace create, right, I've got my bash history up. I've got a nomad namespace create. I could create a namespace based on anything I want. So I'm going to create the ones from my, my bash history here, right? I can say I created four namespaces, logistic, dev, and prod. That'll be the emphasis of our demo here. I can see that I've created some namespaces of which there's nothing inside them. This is my jobs that are running in, in the default namespace. Um, if I look at where I'm at now, I look at the infra and look at my logistics, Quota, we're going to talk in some namespaces are made. I'm going to make some quotas. So I can just go and check if I do nomad namespace status uh, logistics dev, right? I can see there's no quota assigned to that particular namespace, make it a fraction bigger. So I'm going to, I want to assign that to a namespace. Uh, and same as with prod, right? Nothing's assigned. So I'm going to do nomad quota apply. Uh, logistics quota. And if I look at the prod namespace, what have I done there, Berkey? Logistics list prod quota. I can see that I will add that to the namespace if I do actually namespace apply. Yeah, that's all right. Nomad, guys are being nervous, right? Nomad name uh, quota status logistics prod quota shows it up and running. Yep. Beautiful. And then I actually go and look at it. If I do Nomus, yeah, that's right. I get myself worked up. Now I actually need to apply it to a namespace because I've made this in two separate pieces. I need to actually go and apply this to a namespace. So namespace apply. And I'll do the quota and I'll actually use the quota name, right? Which is here. And then the actual the uh namespace name itself, which is logistics broad, right? And then if I actually go back and look at the status, you'll see that things are applied now, right? If I go to namespace status, you see that it actually adds it in, right? So that's we're about to tie those two things together, which means now anything scheduled inside logistics prod now has an upper roof of 4,500 and 4,000, which means I've started control out there, which is nice. All right. so. I have pre-built the Nomad integration for the uh, this because I didn't have time to do so. But if I do Nomad ACL uh, policy info prod operations, right, I'm going to reveal my particular things here. So the production operations team has the ability to read and then do writes against nodes, operator plugins, right? So just some default policies there. If I want to create a Nomad token in the first example without Vault integration, I'm going to do a Nomad ACL. I'll just do it for my bash history to save myself some typing. ACL token create, right? And I can create a token for myself to do things. So I take this value, export nomad token, and away I go, right? I can use that token there. Now, as we know that I require a management token to do this, right? Which requires someone of administration ability. It's not great for self-service. So what we want to move to is leveraging Vault's dynamic integration to read from that, right? So what I'm going to do is Vault read Nomad creds engine uh, role name is what I called it. And I can see here, what I've done is I've issued a Nomad uh, credential. And if I use validate that against Nomad ACL token info, and if I want to say it's against the accessor ID for memory, is that I can see Nomad can reconcile this. Reconcile here, right? The secret ID inside Vault 
is the same secret ID I read inside Nomad. So you can see Vault has programmed Nomad dynamically, right? I've logged into Vault with Azure Active Directory, proven on Berkey, or Mel's done the same thing to use the same example all the way through. And I can see now that I have, um, you know, the secret reconciled end to end, which is super, which means I can now do based on what the role says, based on these policies, which are assigned to my token, policy one, two on the Nomad side, which is some read and write ones I've got, I can now provision things, super. Now I am going to run a job. So Nomad, I've got two minutes before Q and A, so I want to be mindful of time. Nomad job run. I'm going to run my web app. Now I have not uplifted this version to version one, so I've got deprecated config here. So I'm going to, you know, <laughs> mea culpa. I haven't done it time to fix that. It still will work nicely, but what I can see here is I have that warning there, right? That my my job has been scheduled. Now, looking in my UI to the left-hand side, I can go to logistics prod and see inside my prod namespace, I have my vault demo node running. I can see it's happily running. It's been allocated, it's reserved. And if I do look at my quotas here, ooh, uh, quota, right? And look at the quota status, I can see that quota now is actually using 100 of my 4500 and 300, just under 10%, like eight, nine, eight or 9% of my quota there. Right, it's been used by this particular workload. So I can see that enforcement happening, which is nice. Now, if I look at my nomad allocations, if I do nomad job status uh, namespace equals logistics prod, and it's called nomad vault demo, I will be able to get information about my environment running again. And I can see here that job's been running, it's up and running happy days. Now I can do an allocation status and pull out the information about this environment, I can see this is running nicely. The allocation will give me information about the runtime, including but not limited to the UI, which will prove that here, if this runs, 404 not found is fine because there's nothing being served there. And if I write names, I get my web server talking to my database server, which is super because if I do this and hop into this folder here, oops, put my allocation version, not my IP address. I can quickly jump into my container. I can just do CD, uh, where are we? CD, CD uh, demo, isn't it? You know what, cheat sheet time, because I have this Etsy demo. So there we go. Yeah, Etsy demo, right? If I've got a cat here, I'm looking at my config. There's my live token, right? And to prove it's not pre-stage, you look at the, the previous example in my presentation, these will look different, right? This is being created on demand for me for this presentation, which you can see here, right? They're different credentials made on demand as that workload is scheduled. If I reschedule this workload, that dynamic credential gets reissued, which is super nice. So at a high level of takeaways of this, just closing this one off here, is that I have my demo done, guardrails. Nomad provides you guardrails for multi-tenancy that allows operators just to control the environment, but without blocking the developers from their flow, right? If the CID, CICD tool is pushing applications into production or dev, if it's um, doing things in their environment, they have guardrails that are somewhat visible to them, but they can't do sort of silly things to jump around them. Boundaries allow them to control, uh, control the operator, how much you can use how much you expect to use and be respectful of your other neighbors. And if you need more quota and resources, actually ask for it, not just go and, you know, you know, like the Kool-Aid do to the wall, hey, 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 come and take it all. Policy allows me that granularity in control, who can read, who can write, who can schedule, who can delete, right? Things that are important to different roles inside any type of organization. And then self-service. Self-service means that you know, things like I don't, but Mel doesn't have to wake me up being I'm Australian, she's American at some ungodly hour for a token. Log in with the vault, log in with identity, access the Nomad integration, and away you go, right? There's the token, there's the keys, happy days. Now, all of that is pretty uh, nice and tight. It works well. This can be as elaborate or as, a, or as simplified and streamlined as you want it to be. All I can say is I recommend using something like Terraform so provided to do uh, infrastructure as code against the logical topology of, of Nomad to ensure that you can, or if you blow this cluster away, you can repeatedly deploy it as opposed to using CLI commands. And I just thought I wouldn't mix too many topics together today in half an hour. But with that, um, I'm Berkey. This was considerations for your multi-tenancy cluster. 
And uh, yeah, I hope that this has been helpful. And uh, back to you, Mel.